So good evening from Bangkok. Uh, welcome to our sixth webinar organized by AIGS. I'm Nisha. Hope you are all going very well. So tonight we uh, invite our old friends Rui again to give a speech on the Pulse Historical Review. I know everyone know Rui very much here. I believe most of the attendees here, they, they already attended Rui's webinar maybe before. So I don't need to do too much introduction to Rui today because everyone knows he's, uh, he's one of the most knowledgeable gemologists in the world. And also he's the founder of the Home Gemology. So he has organized 14 webinars already. He's marvelous because he's trying to help people who are stuck at home. So today, um, after his presentation, there will be a polling session. So it will be a small quiz just to test how much you have learned from the webinar. Then after that, uh, you can may put your questions in the question and the answer session. So we will try to select some to answer. Then um, don't worry about if you miss some parts of the webinar because we will share the recorded video tomorrow or the day after tomorrow in our AIGS website, uh, Facebook and uh, which, uh, YouTube channel. So you can check there. So now I think I will give the floor to Rui directly and uh, he will share his knowledge with everyone. So welcome, Rui. Hello, Ting. Thank you very much. I mean, you were quite generous and, uh, in, your, in your presentation. And uh, thank you very much for mentioning the, the Home Gemology webinar that, that we started like more than a month ago and have gathered a lot of people all around the world. And I'm truly happy to be back here at AIGS for this, uh, uh, I think it's the fifth webinar you're organizing or the sixth, I have no idea. And I was uh, honored to, to serve on the first one on emeralds and now uh, on pearls. So thank you very much, uh, Kennedy and uh, Ting, for this uh, very kind invitation. So I think without any further ado, let's, I'm going to share my screen and uh, let's entertain our people with uh, knowledge about pearls. So let me share the right screen. So, okay, there we go. So today, um, what we are going to talk about is about a very simple uh, historical review on pearls. And we will start uh, addressing what is a pearl, uh, because uh, maybe we have to know, know exactly what we are talking about when we say the word pearl. And also discuss only briefly the, the mollusks, the animals that uh, give rise to most commercially available pearls. Uh, but that will be very, very limited, that kind of information. And also um, some pearl nomenclature rules that CIBJO, the World Jewelry Confederation, has collated in the Pearl Book that after all, uh, um, it's now available to everybody that wishes to download on CIBJO website. And I will tell you that website in a minute. And also, uh, briefly also, because this is a little bit historical also, historical use of the pearl throughout the ages, not only in antiquity, but all, almost to present time. And I will finish with the emergence of the first cultured pearls in the late 19th century, beginning of the uh, 20th century. So this is quite simple, not very complicated, and not that much information, I hope, so that you can take away some, some of those few things with you when you, when you turn off the, the TV or the computer and you might have learned something today. So what is a pearl? And scientists, they have a, a definition of pearl that takes all the romance away from the pearl, which is, is a naturally formed concretion, meaning it's uh, something solid, a heart that is grown naturally from a natural um, uh, mechanism, a nat natural method, inside a pearl sac. What it is a pearl sac? Uh, this is a sac. Look at, not at the screen, but at my image. So imagine that you have something that grows inside this sac that basically is like a cell membrane. So to be named a pearl, that solid concretion must be grown inside a, a sac of epithelial cells. That is called a pearl sac. So, and this is what defines a pearl. Any other object, solid thing, that might grow inside the mollusk, not inside a pearl sac, is not a pearl. 
okay? But that's a definition. And of course, almost any mollusk can grow a pearl inside of them. But mostly what we call, or the scientists, they call the bivalves, which are the shells with two valves, okay? Like uh, oysters, like clams, like uh, all those uh, seafood that we love eating with a nice uh, wine or a nice beer in the summertime that we are now experiencing at home. And also some gastropods. And gastropods are like the sea snails, for instance. And all of those guys, they have a hard shell. And because they have a hard shell, we know that some cells within that animal are capable of growing that hard um, thing. And, and those are a few images that you can see over there, which, um, which actually you can see on your left, a bivalve, one valve, one shell of one bivalve, and on the other, one shell of a gastropod of a sea snail. And, and this is interesting, those animals that can produce a natural pearl, they live both on salt water and they live also on uh, seawater, salt water and fresh water, sorry. And in between, when the river meets the sea, so they live in water reservoirs all across the globe. One of the mollusks I forgot to mention is a cephalopod. With cephalopods, I like the squid, the octopus, and they don't have a hard shell, but there is one that has a hard shell, and maybe all of you know, which is the nautilus. And nautilus, they may occasionally, very rarely also, produce a pearl. But mostly the mollusks that produce pearls, they are bivalves or they are the gastropods, the so-called sea snails. Interestingly, what the most common commercially pearls that are nacreous, that have that kind of surface that we immediately relate to matter of pearl or to pearls, they come from a group of animals that we, in the jewelry industry, we call them pearl oysters. But for those of you that are biologists, I don't know if, you, if there is any biologist in the room, but if you are biologist, you would feel like, oh, you, can call, you cannot call them those species oysters because they are not oysters. They are pterids, which is another group of mollusks. The true oysters for biologists are these, the edible oysters. And I'm, I'm looking forward for restaurants to open so I can have some in the restaurant because they are really good. And those guys, those are the real oysters. But we must not forget that our industry, uh, or uh, better said, nomenclature or the lexicon, has to do with the proper context where it is said. If you are on the academia, on a, on a biology um, forum, you should use correct biological nomenclature. Therefore, you wouldn't never call an oyster to a pintata massima or a pintata radiata or a pteria sterna or any other bivalve that produces commercially available pearls and cultured pearls. But if you are in the jewelry trade, which is all of us here today, you can call them the proper name that we in the industry we recognize as a pearl oyster. So make sure that uh, um, you all understand that nomenclature has to do with the context where you use it. And we have, uh, for instance, even in mineralogy, most of you have, uh, you know what marcasite is. It's a, it's a, it's a me metallic luster um, mineral that is used in silver jewelry and was quite popular in the 1930s. But to be correct, that material that we use in jewelry, and we call, we call it marcasite, is not marcasite. The mineralogists, they call it pyrite, which is totally different mineral, same composition, but different mineral. And the conclusion of what, I, what I'm trying to say is, make sure you understand where you are using the nomenclature. If it is on the jewelry industry, you have the, the rules and the rules are published on Simjo Blue Books, and I will tell you all about that in a minute. And, but if you are in the academia, if you are on a scientific forum, make sure you use the correct scientific names. Of course, there is a balance and common sense between names of materials and names of species and names of products. That, that's what 
our industry deals with. We don't deal with materials, we deal with products. The scientists, they can deal with materials. So, to keep this uh, um, description of, uh, oh my voice, I have to drink some water. Description of what is a pearl, it is composed of a biomineral, if you wish, a biomineralization of calcium carbonate in the form of aragonite or calcite. And there is also organic matter and water around it. If you want to know everything about this, make sure you go to the, YouTube, the GIA YouTube channel. Uh, Nicholas Sturman, he's a pearl identification um, expert at GIA Bangkok. He gave a terrific presentation the other day that is available on YouTube. And I strongly recommend that you log in to the GIA YouTube and watch Nick's uh, presentation. It's quite um, clarifies all those scientific issues that I'm just only briefly uh, passing through them. And uh, it's great knowledge that he's sharing and he's quite an expert. And of course, uh, the pearls that we are used to in the industry, they are mostly nacreous. So they surface, they look like matter of pearl. They are still that, that kind of iridescent kind of look that we immediately associate with the pearl. But some of the pearls, and actually some really valuable pearls, they are non-nacreous. And what you see on your screen now in pink, it's a quite nice conch pearl that is grown in the Caribbean in a very special gastropod. And um, very rarely, and the fishermen that fish those uh, gastropods for, for the food industry, very occasionally, very rarely, they collect one of those pearls. Um, in Asia, you, ha you have the mellow pearls that come from the mellow species uh, gastropod, and sometimes they can be quite big. They are really popular in Vietnam, and they are really very expensive. To give you an idea of the proper nomenclature and proper systematization, sorry about my English, of the pearl products, the natural pearl products, this is the chart that is published on Sibjo Blue Book that is available at Sibjo website at www.sibjo.org. Make sure you, found, you find the banner uh, for the Blue Books and you can download this for free. And you will find this chart that clearly shows you that natural pearls they are divided into freshwater, saltwater, and then into nacreous and non-nacreous. And then you have the, the different pearl types and also the treatments that natural pearls might be subjected to. And you have similar charts for cultured pearls and it's really well systematized, the information in there. So again, um, I also strongly recommend you to visit Sibjo website and try to download for free the, the latest edition of the Pearl Book, I think. It's the 2017 edition. A new edition will be published shortly. So make sure you stay tuned so you can get the latest, uh, the latest updates. One of the things, one of the names that you see on this chart is, I, I hope that you see my cursor, is the name Blister and the name Blister Pearl. Two uh, for the non-English natives, and I'm one of them. When I first, and. Uh, my first language is Portuguese. Maybe my second is Spanish, and uh, English comes uh, almost in the last. And when I heard the name Blister, I thought it was a really technical name, like wow, a blister. But it's not. Look at look look at the camera now. I, I think you see those pills, medicine pills. This is called a blister, okay? And I didn't know that. So a blister is not a technical term; is an English term for things like this, like bubbles, okay? And those blisters in the pearl industry, they are called blisters because they look like this, okay? And this is at the uh, Sibjo Blue Book that you can download for free, uh, as I told you. And this is in one of the clauses, and this image is, one of, is taken from one of the clauses in the Sibjo Blue Book, explaining what is a natural blister. And what is a natural blister? A natural blister, or a shell blister, if you wish, is when naturally, without human intervention, something happens to the shell where, imagine that this is the shell, 
some bug comes from outside the shell, perforates the shell and harms the shell itself. And of course, the animal starts covering that irritation with shell, making a bubble. The other type of natural blister is when something goes, oh, you see the leaves here, something goes inside between the shell and the mantle and the tissues and irritates the animal here. And of course, the, the animal starts covering that foreign object with layers of nacre, layers of shell. And this, when this happens, those are not pearls because we don't see a pearl sac, right? No pearl sac, so those are not pearls, those are blisters. And because they are naturally formed, we call them natural blisters. But we also have natural blister pearls. And when you see the word pearl in there, it's because that round thing formed on the pearl sac, but it was formed already on the pearl sac, and then eventually it adhered to the shell and it became not glued, it became bonded to the shell. And on top of that pearl already formed, natural pearl that fell, perforated the, the mantle and adhered to the shell, okay, the shell then starts to cover it with layers of nacre. And when you have that, then you have a natural blister pearl. It's a pearl because it formed on a sac. It's natural because there is no human intervention. And it's a blister because on top of that natural pearl, you have the layers of nacre. So, and those, sometimes those are very difficult to identify, but that's not the, the topic of our webinar today. That's up to the experts. And, and I'm, I'm not definitely a pearl identification expert. So and this is to explain to you what is the difference between a natural blister and a natural blister pearl. But most of you um, are uh, familiar with the fact that we see a lot of cultural blisters. And the thing, I see that somebody has got, hasn't closed the microphone. I, can you please check because I'm hearing a lot of sounds on my, on my earpiece. I have no idea who has the microphone on, but uh, please shut it down. Thank you very much. So to continue, um, the cultural, what you see on the market might be a cultural blister pearl. And what is a cultural blister pearl? Is when a cultural pearl formed on a cultural pearl sac, like an Akoya cultural pearl, a South Sea cultural pearl, a Tahitian cultural pearl, have already formed inside the pearl oyster, the pearl mollusk, if you wish. And it perforated the mantle and that cultural pearl adhered to the shell. But that's not very common. But it can happen, and it's called a cultural blister pearl. What it does happen is a cultural blister, but not a cultural blister pearl. And what is a cultural blister is when man, with human intervention, goes to a shell, and uh, usually it's a, it used to be on the pateria penguin shell that the Japanese called Mabe Gai, Mabe, if you wish, Mabe shell, and the man used to put some cabochon-like uh, external materials in that shell and the shell would cover it with shell, with nacre. And, and uh, in the image that you see, it's not a pteria penguin, it's a pteria sterna, which locally in Mexico is called the ostra nacar, but in English the vernacular is rainbow lip pearl oyster. And those chaps that you see on your left, not a pearl uh, necklace, of course, but the, the, the cabochon-like or the blister, okay? Remember, the blister-like pearl products and the pendant on that lovely necklace, those are not blister pearls. Those are not natural blisters. Those are cultural blister products. And usually in the trade, those cultural blisters, they have to be assembled, they have to be uh, treated in some way as an assembled product for durability, and therefore they are in an inaccuracy, and according to the Sibjo uh, rule, they are assembled cultural products. And that's it. So 
um, I don't, I didn't mean to be very boring, but just to make sure when you use the word blister, make sure you know exactly what you are talking about. Because usually on the market, on the trade, what you see, what we see are assembled cultural blisters that are collectively termed Mabe pearls, but we know it's not a pearl, not formed on a pearl sack, okay? So let's start the history thing. So it was only nomenclature up until now, and I still have a few minutes to, um, to go. So we, we, I couldn't speak about historical or the history of pearls without going really way back in history and talking about fossil pearls. And of course, mollusks, they, they are known in the planet for 500 million years approximately, uh, particularly on 200 million years approximately. And of course, some, if some of those shells have been fossilized, and we know a lot of uh, fossil shells, occasionally some pearls and some blisters, they have been fossilized, like this one, which is 16.5 million years old, at the Nat Naturhistorische Museum in Wien. Sorry about my German accent. And this one at the Natural History Museum in London, uh, which is also a really interesting a set of uh, pearls uh, that are quite old, older than me, for sure. And, and this, is, I, I, um, this is quite interesting. Uh, three to four years ago, uh, the internet, uh, even myself, we published that those two roundish uh, opals could be opalized natural pearls, meaning opalized fossils or fossil pearls. But eventually it was proven that this is quite controversial and they might not be pearls after all. They are just mere opals. But sometimes you can have opalized fossils, as most of you know, but not as far as I know opalized pearls. But I mean, those are lovely pictures. That's why I mention them. So, and pearls in history, with man, during mankind. Archaeologists have found a lot of evidences of the use of pearls in many parts of the world, from Japan to the Middle East to the Americas. And this pearl, uh, it was found in 2012, eight years ago, and it was carbon dated with that kind of a technique that archaeologists use using the isotope for the, the carbon 14 isotope. Uh, to date the pearls, and they dated it for, uh, and they, they um, saw that it was like uh, 7,000 years old approximately. More recently, in 2017, they found that even older pearl, a few centuries older, which is the, uh, the so-called Abu Dhabi pearl, it was found in Mah Maha, oh sorry, my Arabic, Marahua Island, sorry. I don't speak, I know how to say Sabah el Nur, Sabah el Khair, but uh, nothing more. So, and uh, this was found, this is a Wardi, Wardi pearl means a pinkish natural pearl. And um, it was dated, also radiocarbon dated, a few years older uh, than the one I just showed you a couple of uh, minutes ago. And this proves that in that area of the Gulf, there is a lot, there was a lot of pearl activity in the past. And the, the red dots that you see on the screen show archaeological places where natural pearls, of course, have been found uh, uh, through a lot of uh, scientific research. But if we look at the Arabian Gulf or Persian Gulf, uh, whatever you, you prefer, we see that Basra in Iraq, which is Iraq, I don't know how to say Iraq in English, Iraq in, um, in Arabic, Basra or Basra, if you, if you prefer. It's a name, which is a town in Iraq, uh, that is very close related to pearls. But today in India, and if you live in India, and if you like pearls, you have definitely heard about Basra pearls. Basra pearls is a trade name for natural pearls from the Gulf, but not from Basra, because Basra in Iraq didn't have any pearl producing activity. It was merely a trading center for pearls between the Middle East and India. Of course, India is, um, uh, in the past, the, the Gulf, India, and in Europe, Paris were like the, the three main trading centers 
for pearls. Anini is a quite important one. In the 16th century, it was in Goa. In the 18th century, it was Surat. And then later in Mumbai, Mumbai, it's Bombay in the, in the, in the old days. And in India, especially in Bombay, the name Basra is quite important because it stands for Gulf pearls. Interestingly, in the Gulf, um, the, uh, in Arabic, it's called Bahraini pearls because most of the pearls in the Gulf being produced today and also in the past, they came from Bahrain, which is here on this area that I'm pointing out in the near Qatar and, uh, and the uh, Saudi Arabia. And still today is the most important natural pearl producing area. And actually, uh, if you travel to Bahrain, if you can travel to Bahrain in the near future, you can buy a license to dive for pearls, so you pay a certain amount, and you are allowed to fish up to 60 pearl oysters, the Pintata radiata, that they have there. They are quite small, the size of my, of my palm here. And you can open them, and if you are lucky, you can get one pearl, and uh, if you are very lucky, you can have several pearls, and if you are extremely lucky, you might have a pearl above four millimeters, which is like, wow, it's crazy. So, but this is to clear up. Basra, it's a town in Iraq. It didn't produce pearls. I mean, like turquoise, you know, turquoise, the blue gem material that was traditionally produced in Iran and also in Egypt, in the Sinai Peninsula. It is named turquoise, but it doesn't come from Turkey. It was traded in Turkey, not produced in Turkey. So the Basra pearls is basically the same thing. And of course, the Gulf still is today, not only the most important producing area, but also agglomerates the most important consumers of natural pearls and collectors of natural pearls. And here I share with you a really astonishing picture by Tashnim Al-Sultan uh, with Hassan Al-Fardan and Adi Al-Fardan and, and, uh, and Adi's grandfather on the, on the painting in the back with their natural pearl collection. They are from Dubai and uh, in that area of the world, not only in uh, Arabia, but also in Persia, in Iran, the appreciation for pearls, it's immense and is really profoundly rooted in culture. And by the way, also in religion, because in the Holy Quran, you don't see that many mentions to precious materials, but you see a lot of mentions to pearls and by the way, also to precious corals. So, if you were astonished that those pearls in the Gulf were 7,000 years old, were quite old, even more recently, uh, an even older um, pearl wreck, a pearl site was discovered in the Americas, in Mexico, showing that while in the Gulf, uh, the, in the Neolithic, pearls were already harvested and produced, also in the Americas, in Mexico, they were also uh, being produced. So it was a they were produced everywhere. And uh, our ancestors, they were, maybe they were collecting oysters or shells because they wanted fish bait or food, or they were looking for beautiful shells. Radiocarbon dating really helps history of pearls. And those pearls, they were found in the Java Sea in Indonesia. They were radiocarbon dated on a research performed by the Swiss Gemological Lab, SSCF. But the challenge with the radium carbon dating of marine artifacts, which pearls, they are definitely one of those, is to know exactly where the pearls were produced. Otherwise, you will have a big, you will do a big mistake. Because for those of you that know radiocarbon dating, we know that in marine reservoirs, we need to know exactly uh, where is the reservoir and where the pearl or the artifact was picked up so we can do the testing and do the corrections. There, there is a lot of dating corrections that have to be made according to the place where the pearls were found. But that's too scientific. You can read all about it in the, if you log into SSCF website, look for the Facet magazine. And there is one of the issues where this subject is extensively um, um, explained. And of course, those natural pearls have been used in civilization, especially during Roman times. And this is quite a, this is not like a regular painting. This was like a mummy portrait. A mummy is like when they mummified the bodies of the deceased, they would place in, in, the, in, the, in the front of the mummy, those portraits of, uh, of the face of the person. 
And this lady that you see over there, she, she passed away, not from the coronavirus, but from uh, some other uh, illness because she was quite young. And to, it was traditional to paint her face and put in the front of the, of, of the mummy. And you look at the painting and you see pearl earrings and you see a pearl and emerald necklace. And a pearl and emerald necklace, this was sold at Christie's many years ago. It was emeralds from Egypt and pearls from the Gulf. They were quite popular in Roman times and they were quite favorite to Cleopatra as well. And uh, we see in a uh, British Museum, make sure you, you visit the British Museum whenever you can again, because you will find a lot of pearl set jewelry from that kind of period in the first century, three, four, four up until the end of the Roman Empire. Of course, when you go to, um, to um, the Byzantine period, we will notice, and if you go to Italy, to Ravenna, to the church of San Vitale, make sure you visit those mosaics and look at the Empress Theodora mosaic and all those white things, those are pearls. Those are natural pearls. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Kika, faz menos barulho, filha. It's my daughter. She's doing a lot of noise. Sorry about that. We are all confined at home. So, and um, also in Byzantine jewelry, we not only in, uh, in mosaic, but also in jewelry, we see a lavish use of pearls in the Byzantine period. And uh, this, uh, this one is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And this is interesting. I haven't studied this, uh, this crown. This is a historically very important crown in Europe. It's the imperial crown of the Holy Roman Empire. And we see a lot of gem materials, including emeralds and, uh, and, um, and sapphire. And we see a lot of pearls. And some of those pearls, it is said that in the medieval ages in Europe, a lot of those pearls, they were actually not from salt water, but they were from um, fresh water um, harvested in Europe, in rivers in Europe. And we know also that in Russia, in the border with Finland, up until the early 20th century, a lot of pearls were harvested from rivers, ponds, and lakes from this uh, uh, pearl mussel called the Margaritifera Margaritifera that produced immensely um, uh, pearls in this period, not only for the Russian um, Romanov period jewelry, but also uh, in Central Europe, in Bohemia, in, um, in Bavaria, which is Bayern in, 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 in Germany, in Scotland, uh, on that animal, the Margaritifera Margaritifera, uh, produced quite a lot of natural pearls. And it's interesting that there is a medieval text saying that jewelers, they must disclose, or if they use uh, saltwater pearls, the so-called oriental pearls, along with fresh water pearls, they should disclose that they are using both or they shouldn't mix them up at all. Showing, interestingly, that even 700 years ago, there was um, um, a concern about consumer confidence because the oriental pearls, they were ooh la la, they were imported, so they were quite, uh, quite uh, more expensive. And the freshwater pearls, they were local and they were not as nacreous, not as beautiful and not, not as expensive. Also in America, the Native Americans, in the archaeological sites, we know that they were also um, harvesting the local freshwater pearls that many of us, we are not aware that they were really important even in American and European jewelry in the in late 19th century, early 20th century. And um, there, is, there was a huge production of natural pearls in America, almost in all states of America, but particularly on the Tennessee and Mississippi rivers, but also in Ohio, like those pearls that you are seeing uh, at, at, on your screen that are from a 2000 year old uh, Hopewell Mound site in Ohio, they were quite important. And I will address only a little bit of that uh, later on. And of course we have all the pearls from the Caribbean, and this is, those are, that have been dubbed Columbus pearls. They, they didn't belong to Columbus, to Christopher Columbus, but they are definitely from the same age. They were carbon dated and they were found uh, like a few years ago by Peter Bellag, a pearl collector. And those are a few more images of his collection of really old necros pearls from the Caribbean, from Venezuela or Panama. 
all those pearls, and now we, we have to mix up the pearls from the Americas, the pearls even from Asia, from Myanmar, and the pearls from, uh, <coughs> sorry, the pearls from the, from the Gulf, <coughs> the pearls from, from the Gulf of Manar between Sri Lanka and India, all of those pearls, they were mixed up and they, they would arrive uh, Europe and the jewelers, they would use them at their will. And sometimes when the pearls were baroque, they would be set in jewelry on such a way that they would look like uh, bodies of, uh, they were suggestive for creative minds like, like you can see on your screen. And this is a very well-known jewel. And uh, actually there is a, uh, apparently there is a controversy bet uh, um, on the dating of this pearl, but the Victorian Albert Museum on their official website, they date this jewel as a 19th century reproduction of a Renaissance-like jewel. So this looks like a Renaissance, uh, according to the experts at the Victorian Albert, they, this looks like a Renaissance jewel, but it's actually a 19th century artifact. And, but to look at the, at the shape of that Baroque pearl that was uh, masterly used to create that um, body of that uh, figurine. So it's quite amazing the use of pearls and creativity. And uh, this is in Holland in the Richt Museum in Amsterdam. It's, it's great to, to, to visit that museum, not only because of the paintings, but also because of the jewelry. And by the way, there is a really large Indonesian diamond in there. And the people don't relate diamonds with Indonesia. And there is a quite large one in the, in the Richt Museum in Amsterdam. And this is a typically late 17th century bow lace with a, embellished with pearls, quite an unusual way of using pearls, by the way. And I am, those of you that know me know that I love this monstrance. Monstrance is like a Catholic devotional implement that is used for ceremonies to display the Holy Sacrament and the Holy Host. And the place where the Holy Host is, uh, is secured on this monstrance in my country usually is on silver, uh, silver gilt, gold, or with diamonds. Here is with local natural pearls, possibly from Venezuela, from Isla Margarita. And by the way, Margarita means pearl in uh, Greek. So if you are Margaret, you, your name is Pearls. In, um, and this is just for you to see uh, the size of that monstrance that is quite, quite, quite big. So, of course, pearls were extensively used throughout the ages, not only as strands, but also in art. And I'm much more fond of showing you the use of pearls in art, especially in Art Nouveau. And you see here three monsters of Art Nouveau jewelry, Fouquet, Alcock, and René Lalique. And they used pearls as pendants. And if you remember the use of pendants in the Renaissance, you recognize it's kind of the same style and they're using singular, not, um, not round pearls. Some they, sometimes they were Baroque, sometimes they were oval, sometimes they were pear shaped, but they were used as drops, as it was common in the 16th and 17th century. And this is a, an astonishing grasshopper necklace by René Lalique. It's on the Gulbenkian Museum in my country, Portugal. So whenever you are able to travel, make sure you join us, eat some sardines, very good, by the way, and uh, our food and our wines and our weather and our art museums. And um, at the Pearl Symposium in Bahrain uh, in November, organized by Danat, um, one lady, uh, Jean Latandres, a specialist in freshwater, in American freshwater uh, pearls. She um, expressed the, uh, the idea that many of the pearls that um, uh, Art Nouveau artists were using in creations like Lalique, they were not actually saltwater natural pearls from Asia, from, uh, from the Gulf, from wherever. They were actually natural pearls from the Americas because if you read the book of the pearl by George Frederick Kunz, you will see that there was a pearl rush in America in the late 19th, late 19th century, early 20th century. And so pearl production was quite strong in America and they produced quite large pearls. But the thing is, I haven't studied yet this necklace and I, I wouldn't, I need, I need equipment to do so properly. But it's, it's interesting to think that many of the large pearls 
in the Art Nouveau collection, they might be freshwater natural pearls and not saltwater natural pearls, something for science to figure out. And, and we are close to the end of my talk, and let's just dive in that time of the history where natural pearls, they were quite expensive, they were quite exclusive, and they were, and they still are, quite rare when cultural pearls appeared. And they appeared not by chance. We know that the Chinese in the, in the, in the Middle Ages, 12th, 13th century, they were experimenting with blisters. They were experimenting with a, with a local muscle, a freshwater muscle, experimenting doing blisters. Remember when I said the blister was something that was covered by the shell? So they were producing actually cultured blisters in the shape of Buddha. Uh, but this, that is very old. The National History Museum in London, they have a nice example of it. And the Carl von Linn, that uh, in Latin we, we say Linnaeus, uh, for those of you that are biologists, you know this guy, uh, because he's quite famous in the biological world. Um, this gentleman, uh, in the 1742, he started to research on a way to produce artificially, now we call it culturing, uh, a pearl. And he did experiments not in salt water, but in the, in the local duck mussel that lived around his area in Sweden. So he, he I don't know how to pronounce, Fidisan River, something like that. So he was using the duck mussel that lives on that river to make experiments to produce culture pearls. And he managed to produce a few, like you can see on that image. But he was unable to sell his patent. He was unable to say, hey, guys, I just discovered a way to produce some pearls. His method was not perfect. And I mean, it, they were not like the pearls that we know today, the cultural pearls that we know today. But he managed to do something because he understood the principles of culturing uh, way before Mikimoto. But he, he died without selling his rights. But th that, that's part of history. And this is important because he was using the local duck mussel in Sweden to do this experiment. Of course, cultural pearls were mentored and that they started with this gentleman, Kokishi Mikimoto. He, he, was, a, he, he was a very intelligent man, an entrepreneur. He, didn't, he wasn't afraid to risk. And he, did, he was crazy, basically, with all due respect, those crazy visionaries that invest everything they can for a passion and for a vision. And sometimes in civilization, we have characters like this that became then very su successful and very famous, like Kokishi Mikimoto. So he started his experiments when he was 30 years old. He started in 1888. And only five years later, did he manage not to produce a cultured pearl, but to produce a cultural blister. Do you remember blister? Okay, shell, something in there and something covering. So he produced a cultural blister in 1893. And this is the type of jewelry that he was selling and that Mikimoto, his company, was selling and promoting uh, in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century. Those were not whole cultural pearls. They were not made in pearl sacks, okay? Remember the pearl sack? Those are not cultural pearls. They're, those are cultural blisters. But look at, at your right to that newspaper, it's the Times, the Japan Times, that advertising, and he called, calls it cultural pearl, a new unrivaled invention. And this is so interesting because we go back a hundred years and we see how an innovation was still not being properly regulated in terms of nomenclature. Something that we might think it also happens with synthetic diamonds, but that's, that's, not, uh, that's not called uh, to, the, to, to the, uh, our webinar today. But this is quite a similar situation. When we look at history, we, we can understand present issues. And this is quite revolutionary, but those were not yet the cultural pearls that we know today as the Akoya cultural pearls. The Akoya Cultural Pearls by Mikimoto, the first one was in 1905, but the patent, uh, the, the document that gave him the rights, uh, the exclusivity of that method was in 1908. 
and the mass production, the production in huge quantities started only a few years later, and they started to arrive in Europe in the 1920s, uh, give or take a couple of years. And this was quite revolutionary because he was using the Akoya pearl mussel, or the, the Akoya, sorry, the Akoya pearl oyster, Pintata fucata, which is that very small um, animal that you see on the screen. And he was using a shell bead. Do you see those beads? That those shell beads, the nucleus, if you want to call them, but it's more correct to call them shell beads or just beads, they were produced by shell from matter of pearl of fresh water mussels from the Americas. So he was importing from the Americas that I, I just told you they were, the Americas were important in producing natural pearls from the rivers, but at the same time, they were exporting the hard shells from the Ohio picto mussel or the, um, the uh, washboard mussel from, uh, it's, uh, there are quite big, uh, thick shells from which you can produce all those beads. And they were shipped to Japan and they were being used in the culturing process in a process called grafting, where the shell bead is introduced in the gonads of that, uh, of that um, muscle, and along with the shell bead, another piece, a tissue mantle piece, which is cells, cells from another animal that you can look at the bottom of your screen, hoping that you can see my cursor. You see here, it looks like miniature sushi. So and, uh, also along with that bead that you see here, the lady, uh, inserting on the gonads, you put a tissue, a mantle tissue, those cells, that those cells, they will start doing, covering the beads into a cultured pearl sac. I always show you the pearl sac because we can call them cultured pearls because they grow inside a cultural pearl sac. That's why they're not blisters. That's the difference between the blister and the pearl. And of course, Mikimoto, he did like things like this. And this is an iconic, um, iconic clip by Mikimoto. It was uh, on display at the Paris exhibition in 1937. And uh, for those of you that like this, it, you, can, you, you can mount and dismount this uh, jewelry clip uh, in 12 ways. It's crazy and it, it has a lot of sim symbology behind it. So, and because of cultural pearls and because of Mikimoto, the natural pearl industry and if you sum to the impacts of the cultural pearls if you sum the great depression of the late 20s early 30s you we can understand the decline of the of the natural pearl harvesting and activities especially in bahrain that suffered quite a lot with those two things the depression and the uh, the great demand for cultured pearls and then it was the second world war and then after that, it was basically only cultured pearls that were actually in great demand all across the globe, uh, not only produced in China, but also then in the Indonesia, in Philippines, in Australia, in Tahiti, Tahiti, which is the French Polynesia. And then also at the same time, experiments were being made in freshwater mussels in Japan. And then uh, they were uh, exported, that technology was experimented in China. Uh, that today produces the large majority of freshwater cultural pearls in the world. So, but in brief, this was kind of a, a brief history of historical aspects of, of pearls. I could choose many other angles, but that was my angle. That was my, my proposition for today. And we still have a few minutes, so I'm just concluding and, um, and uh, we still, so we can have a few, a few minutes for Q&A. So historically, natural pearls came in sense, essentially from the Persian Gulf or from the Arabian Gulf, whatever you wish to call it. And the oldest pearl reported, it's actually 8,500 years old and came from Mexico. And they, this, is, this is reported last year with the archeology span will, will reveal us new things, I'm sure, in the near future. And freshwater pearls actually were coming and being produced in Europe and were extensively used in, the, in, the, in Europe during the Middle Ages, oh sorry, and also, and this is important, make sure you understood on this webinar the difference between a blister, a cultured blister, and a cultured pearl, because they are totally different things. But they share the similar name, blister, but they are totally different products. And the first cultured pearl product 
which is actually a cultural blister, uh, appeared in 1893. And the first hole that is also technically called a cyst pearl, because it grew on a cyst on the pearl sac, it was the first reported in 1905 and production started a few years later. So thank you very much. This is it. Ting, back to you. Thank you so much, Rui, for your wonderful presentation. I always enjoy very much for the photos in the presentation. It's, it's marvelous. Um, thank you very so, much. Yeah, so thank you. So um, we are going to do the polling session, right? So I will launch the polling and uh, the attendees can do the polling first and then we will have a few announcements for our next webinars. So um, I will do the polling first. So I launch it, everyone. So you can fill in the polling first. And uh, by the way, we have a few minutes to introduce to our next webinar. So here uh, I will introduce our next webinar will be for the Dementoid. And um, I will show you the post. So here, share my screen. Yes. So our next webinar, um, the speaker will be Masaki Fruya from Japan, and uh, he will give a talk on his research program in Dementoid Garnet, is on um, hostile inclusion and uh, various regions. So please pay attention to our registration link in the website and the Facebook tomorrow, and we will post it there. So it will be next week, Friday, it's on May 15th. So uh, I will see you next week. So I will give the floor to Rui, and uh, I, I hope like he has, he also has his next webinar uh, next week uh, on Tuesday. So Rui, it's your turn now. Oh, thank you very much, Ting. Um, I mean, just for you to know, uh, I, I'm doing the home webinars with the support of Cedro for for quite some time, and the next one will be on Tuesday, and we'll will be on the a, nom a nomenclature debate. Um, between Jedi Jade or Fei Shui, uh, which is the Chinese way of addressing this kind of very special, very valuable and very important gem material uh, that has been collected in several parts of the world uh, and this one especially in Burma, in Myanmar. So it will be interesting. We will have Edward Liu uh, joining us to the scientific expert, experts and I will also have Edward Johnson uh, uh, with me and he he actually, uh, before he became a GIA director and RJC official, he did work with Jade in Hong Kong. So he's quite familiar with the Jedi world and he will join me and uh, trying to um, explain and to share with the audience all the, uh, all the e nomenclature issues and the debate that Steve Joe is currently discussing uh, to make sure that nomenclature is uh, global and we, we all uh, talk the same language. Thank you so much, Rui. So I will ab absolutely be there for your Fei Cui uh, webinar because as Chinese, I'm very interested in Fei Cui. So, yeah. uh, and I also want to listen to Dr. Edward Liu. I think I, he I heard he like he's very knowledgeable in Fei Cui. So we can't miss it. So I'm, I feel it's very interesting because next week is for all for green stones. We are doing the Dementoid and you are doing the Fei Cui. It's all green stones. So it's for really those of you that are Portuguese, uh, green is a very, very good color in football, but oh, only really? the Portuguese will understand. Wow, that's interesting to know. So maybe we can end the polling. I will share the result and you can explain to them one by one. Thank you. By all means. Okay. Okay, it's, I think the poll results are already on the screen. So the first question was, a natural pearl is formed inside the pearl sac without human intervention. Yes, that, that's it. And that there are two things that are true on that phrase. The first thing is, inside the, uh, in, inside the pearl sac, otherwise it wouldn't be a pearl, and it is without human intervention, so it is natural. The oldest reported pearl is, uh, most of you got it right, is eight, eight uh, 1,500 years old, it was found in Mexico. And this is to show that uh, the use of pearls really goes back in human civilization and it spreads wherever mo mollusks exist, you might find a pearl. And number three, natural pearls are only from saltwater mollusks. 
every mollusk, saltwater, freshwater, or in between, I don't know the name in English for the in between, they can produce a pearl, especially bivalves and the sea snails or gastropods. Number four, the so called Mabe pearls are blisters, are blister pearls, cultured blister pearls, or assembled blister products. It was the last one. It was the last one because uh, what we call in the trade a Mabe pearl, it's actually Mabe pearl originally was only uh, to be used for the Mabe guy pearl products, the, pe the Pteria penguin. Um, blisters or cultural blisters because it's called mabe because in japanese that shell it's called mabe guy that's the only reason like in the, the japanese uh, pearl oyster we call it akoya that's the local vernacular for that shell the local vernacular for for the uh, pteri penguin is uh, mabe guy and mabe is is you can we, we can accept it as a collective name for a cultural blister but in reality is an assembled cultured product because it's cultured because it, it, it was it has human intervention and it's a blister and it, it is assembled because you need something in, inside and you need a cap so it's an assembled product the last one was the truth one and the, the, the last one was the first cultured pearl product in by uh, sorry the first cultured product by Mikimoto was released in the release maybe it's not the best english but i mean i'm not english native i'm allowed to say nonsense and uh, it's it, it was yes in 1893 and uh, it was the first one the first year that he released a, a, a product a cultured product related to pearls it was not a pearl it was a cultured blister but it was in 1893 and uh, not that many years later those cultural blisters started to appear in jewelry, in Mikimoto jewelry. The, the, the whole pearl, the, the, the Koya cultural pearls, as we know them today, they, the first one was in 1905, patent in 1908, and massive production a few years later, having arrived in Europe in the 1920s, give it or take a few years. And so that's it. And the poll is done. Thank you, Ting. Thank you, Ruiza. I'll stop sharing so you can go to the question and answer session. You may select some questions to answer because I feel like there are 15 questions now. So just try your best. Thank you. And uh, I will only choose the easy ones, as you know. The, the hard ones I will, I, will, I will give to you. So is a Mabe the same as a blister, Catherine Scott asked. I, I, just, I just answered. And um, uh, a Mab Mabe is a actually a Japanese name for a particular kind of shell, Mabegai, Terry Penguin, that was used in the past to make cultured blisters that eventually were called Mabe pearls, but that's technically incorrect, but that's the, the trade term. But the most Mabes, most things that are called Mabes in the trade, they are cultured blisters, not natural blisters. So we, uh, it's not correct to say it's the same as a blister because it's the same as an assembled cultural blister. That, that would be more, more correct. So uh, I have here another one. What is the difference between freshwater pearls and oriental pearls? Hansa Shah. Oriental pearls was a, a very old trade name for pearls that came from the Orient. And fr from the Orient, it was the uh, Gulf pearls and even the Asian pearls, okay? And they were uh, saltwater natural pearls with really good nacre. That's why sometimes when we refer to nacre or to the, the quality of the nacre, we refer to the quality of the orient of the pearl. Does it have a nice orient? It, it came, it, it's like a centuries old expression um, that has to do with the quality of the pearls. And the freshwater pearl, uh, it's different because it doesn't come from the same animals and from the same water reservoirs. Typically, an oriental pearl should mean a saltwater natural pearl, and a freshwater pearl should mean a freshwater a natural pearl from a freshwater mussel around a lake, a pond, or a river. And they were quite popular in Europe, especially in Scotland, in Bohemia, Bohemia, the Czech Republic, also in uh, Germany, in um, Bayern, and also in Russia and Finland, and in Sweden. Uh, 
let me choose another. Okay, dear Rui, in Inesita Gay Echo. The canning jewel is made in the 19th century. Yes, that's, that's what the Victorian Albert experts say. Uh, it was forgery made to imitate Renaissance jewels. Renaissance is the spelling. I mean, uh, I'm allowed to misspell uh, Inesita. And it's therefore called a Renaissance Revival. Thank you very much for your comment. And um, it, it happened also, it happened quite a lot in the, in, the, in the 19th century to have that Renaissance Revival. And thank you for the spelling. I make sure I will get it right next time that I know that I will not, but I mean, I will do the effort. Um, okay, hi, Rui, can you explain what is a blister again? I'm still not clear uh, between the two terms. That's a very good point. I'm going to share again the screen, if you don't mind, so, so I, I can get it much more clearer to you, okay? Because there are two, three things that have to do with the word blister. We have natural blisters, and a natural blister is when some, something perforates the shell from outside or from the inside, and, uh, and uh, that, that thing makes the shell cover uh, that um, foreign substance with shell, making a cabochon, uh, making a bubble, okay, let's call it a bubble so we don't call it a blister. Um, and also when you have some foreign thing going inside the shell, inside the shell, but below the mantle cells, also the mantle cells will start covering this foreign thing with layers of nacre, creating again a bubble. And this is a natural blister or shell blister, if you like. And also we have a natural blister pearl. And a blister pearl implies that you already have a pearl, a pearl was already formed, but then it, 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 it went away from its original place in the, in the animal. It could be the mantle, it could be wherever, because the natural pearls, they can occur in various parts of the animal. And they, they perforated the mantle, those membrane, that cell membrane, and adhered, adhered meaning it, it was glued, sorry, I don't, my English vocabulary is not very extensive, but it was, it, uh, it, it was glued, naturally glued to the uh, shell. And after that, that pearl, already made pearl, was covered with layers of nacre. And it's called a natural. It's natural because there is no human intervention. It's a pearl because it was already a pearl. It was, it was grown on a pearl sack. And it's a blister because it, it is, is a, is on the shape of a bubble because it was covered with layers of nacre. And this is a natural blister pearl. A cultural blister pearl is the same that I just told you, but when the pearl is cultured. So when you have a cultured pearl, this also can happen. And you have the most common type of blister that you see on the market, which is the so-called cultural blister. That is typically an assembled cultural blister because you have a bubble, you see the bubble, and you have uh, the bubble, then it's hollow, and then you have a covering and you have to fill it up with a substance, and then you have like a cape to, 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 to end it up. Usually it's made, made of shell, and you can use it in jewelry like this. And the trade term, the general collective trade term that you, you see on the, on the market for this is actually Mabe pearl. That's why, um, but they are not technically pearls because they are blisters and they are actually an assembled product, okay? I don't know if it was clear enough. Um, uh, Kai Man, can you say if it was, if you are still on the room, Kai, can you, Ka, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name, sorry about that. Kai Man, it, was, it, was it clear? Just say like this, if you are still on the room, if you are not, I will pretend that you are, so okay. I hope it was clear enough. Uh, one more question, please recommend, recommend books on this subject. Oh, there are so many books. Um, Shigeru Akamatsu, he's a, um, a senior uh, pearl expert from Mikimoto. He just released an English translation of a very small book called The Pearl Book uh, that was uh, published by the Pearl, oh, I can't remember, the Pearl, Associ pearl Promotion uh, center of Japan, something like it. It's a very small book with a blue cover. It's called the Pearl Book. 
We also have the original Pearl book. Uh, it's published in 1912 by George Frederick Kunz and uh, Stevenson that uh, Dover publications, they have quite affordable um, uh, versions of that book. You have Alec Farn book on pearls, but uh, it's out of print. Uh, you have, what well, I, I can look for, for some, hold on a second. Oops. Okay, sorry about, this is Alec Farn book on pearls, but you can also only find it secondhand. Of course, Elizabeth Stark Bible on pearls. Elizabeth, then you give me commission. And I strongly recommend you as a historical thing to read this one, which is uh, the George Frederick Kunz. This is a Dover publication version. It's not very expensive. If you are going to buy the original one, prepare a few thousands of dollars and, um, and because it's really very, very expensive, but it is a really beautiful book. Uh, hold on a second, Kika. Pode-me passar um livro azul que ali está, um livro pequenininho azul. I'm just asking my daughter to, to fetch. It, é um livro que diz Pearl. Sim, vai cá. Obrigado, filha. So, and this was the Shigeru Akamatsu book that I was just telling you about. And uh, it's quite, it's quite, an, it's very small. You need a loop to read because the letters are quite small for people like me that need glasses. It's quite challenging, but it's brilliant information that you can find on the Shigeru Akamatsu book. And this is the name of the publisher. It's the Japan Pearl Promotion Society. And, uh, and then I will ask them for commission. Otherwise it's a publicity for free. I'm kidding. So this, uh, these are the books. And uh, Ting, uh, how much time do we have more for questions? Rui, maybe you can have two more questions, no problem. Okay, thank you, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so Karina, that's your reply over there. Uh, Doris Chang, is the pearl sack the reason why pearls are generally round? I mean, pearls are not generally round. The fine quality pearls, those are, gen those are round, but usually pearls are, are baroque. They don't have a, a nice shape, nice. I don't want to say nice or no nice, but they don't have a regular shape. Only very rarely does pearls have a round shape. Cultured pearls, on the other hand, when they, you know, particularly the, the so-called Akoya cultured pearls made in the Pintata Fucata Martensi, if you like, the Akoya pearl oyster in Japan and also in Vietnam and China because they, they can be produced in either of those places. Um, because you use a, sh a round shell bead, which is a sphere, and because there is the, uh, the deposition of nacre on top around that sphere, it's only natural that the shape of a cultured pearl, of a beaded with a bead, cultured pearl is round, is spherical. But in nature, to have a round pearl, it's really rare. It's, it's not very common. The more common shape, it's like the Baroque. I don't know if I answered your question. And so let me choose another easy one. Oh, it's so many. I won't be able to, to reply to all of those things. And, I, I, uh, and I'm not wearing glasses now, so I have to do like this so I can read. Is the... Okay, at, at Blister Pearls, I just uh, that's, I just mentioned this one. Okay. Is the saltwater natural pearl more expensive than a freshwater natural pearl? Um, Andrew, I'm not a uh, gem dealer and uh, I'm, I'm not a market analyst. I wouldn't know how to reply to that one. And I prefer never to mention prices unless they are public prices in auction houses. Uh, Elizabeth Allen, you are mentioning a really important uh, historical pearl, which is the Lake Kasumi, Kasumi Gaura pearl, uh, beaded, uh, beaded cultural pearls in Japan. They are historically very important, and even today, only a, a very limited number of pearl farms are still operating on the lake, and that's a very good question. And they go back in history. They are really very old. Thank you for mentioning that one. And uh, now for the last one. 
Mm. Okay, way de las de lasus uh, is any pearl jewelry for men as example. You, you can use whatever you like. Uh, I mean, I myself, I would love to have a really nice natural pearl uh, uh, pin to wear in weddings, and uh, to uh, I would love to have one. Uh, and that's that's a man jewelry. I don't see any problem why uh, Henry VIII. I think you know the name Henry VIII. He was the King of England. He was father of Elizabeth the First, and you see portraits of Henry VIII. And I mean, he was he was a womanizer. He was not a feminine guy, and he was wearing pearls like crazy because wearing pearls 500 years ago was a sign of great power and great wealth, and it was also to to um, to um, make the Spanish not feel uh, comfortable because the English and the Spanish, they were not kind of friends. And uh, uh, his daughter, Elizabeth I, he, she had a, um, a pirate that was uh, stealing all the pearls and all the precious things from the Spanish. So it's uh, also the political. But anyway, so I think I will choose only one more, not more, one more pearl, but one more question. Uh, books, it's okay. Uh, is uh, all cultural pearls still used? The USL shell beads, yes. The, the USA shell beads, the, not, not only the, the Ohio uh, Picto, uh, which was historically the most important one, but also the washboard, the Megalonias nervosa, and uh, many other shells. They are primarily used even today uh, as shell beads, sometimes referred to as nucleus. But the shell beads are usually from from a shell taken from those freshwater mussels from the USA, from the Tennessee and the Mississippi River reservoirs. Some other alternatives have been tested, not only artificial products like Byronite, but also a typically beads like uh, even other gemstones like uh, uh, turquoise or amethyst, sometimes even natural pearls serving as nucleus or other cultural pearls serving as beads. So and those are called uh, typical beads, but to the most, the industry uses, um, uses freshwater mussels. So I think, Ting, um, we are on the time that you uh, requested. If you have uh, one special question that, that you would love me to answer, please choose an easy one so I don't embarrass myself again. Thank you so much, Rui. You are so nice and also very patient for answering these questions. We learned more from that. So um, I can choose one question for you. Uh, I like to ask, like, uh, because someone they are, they are asking, like, uh, how long it will take for the blisters and pearls to to be um, produced? And um, I saw this is a question, right? Did you see? Did you see that? I saw that, but that was a difficult one, so I skipped it. But I will try. I will try to. <laughs> I I will, to no no problem. <laughs> and then, then when this is over, I will call you and say. Rah, 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 rah. Okay. Just, just kidding. No problem. Yeah. I don't know if my good friend Douglas is on the room, Douglas from Mexico, because he would know because he used to produce those uh, those mabes, those mabe type cultural products in Mexico in Guayamas. Um, and usually it might take, I, I don't want to say any number, but in between eight months to two years, uh, it, it would mean in, uh, in Mexico to produce, but it depends on the muscle, it depends on the animal, it depends on the type of product that you want, it depends on the thickness that you want, but I would say it's about one year. I don't know exactly. It depends on the muscle, it, uh, sorry, on the, on the mollusk, and it depends on the, on the type of thickness that you wish to achieve. But it's not fast, it takes a while. For, for a cultural pearl, for instance, the Ecoya, typically the Ecoya cultural pearls, they take, depending on the naked thickness that you wish, between 10, 12 months, up until 18 months. But in the old days, it could be up to two years, even more. In the South Seas, it can be between one year and three years inside the water. For Daishian, it's between one and two years. In Indonesia and Philippines, also between one year or 18 months and 24 months. So in, in the freshwater cultured pearls in China, depending on the size you want to achieve, it, it can be up to five, six years. Thank you so much, Rui. I like your answer. <laughs>
I mean, to be honest, I didn't know the exact answer yeah. to that question, but I tried to look very knowledgeable in my answer, replying to other things. I think it's a lot of information for the attendees already. I think they still learn a lot from your answer. Thank you so much, Rui. Oh, my, my pleasure. It was really a pleasure to be with uh, all of you in the audience today and a pleasure to be with you, Ting, and with Kennedy and with Henry that I also see here um, on the panel. It was really a privilege to be invited again by such a distinguished institute in Thailand to, to share my passion for gems and gemology. Thank you so much, Rui, for the high comments in AIGS. And uh, thank, thank you for, all, for attending our webinars today. So uh, I think it will be the end of tonight's webinar. So don't forget, next week we'll have a green week for the green gemstones. Uh, for Tuesday, it's a Fei Tui. And on Friday, it will be our Dementoid um, Hostel Inclusion and uh, the various regions. So please make sure you are you are interested and you can attend our webinars. So I think that will be all right. So Rui, thank you very much. So hope to see you next time. So thank you okay, all thank for attending you. our webinar. Bye bye, see you next time. Bye, thank you. Thank you all of you. Thank you, Ting. Thank you, Kennedy.